church. Hello, Pastor. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Lent. Welcome to all who are worshiping with us virtually. What a joy to be together this morning. I have a few announcements to make you aware of. Our Monday morning Bible study continues tomorrow at 1030. We are finishing our book study and next week we'll begin a Lenten study. So if you would like to join us, feel free. <clears throat> Speaking of Lent, you are invited to join us every Wednesday for our midweek soup suppers in Fellowship Hall at 6 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet on the little table right in the narthex. Please sign up if you think that you will be coming so we have enough food for everyone. Uh, you don't have to contribute to the meal, but there is a place to sign up or an opportunity on the sign-up sheets if you would like. We had a great time at our first one. It was a lovely, lovely evening, so I really hope you will consider joining us. Tomorrow, we have the food pantry here at Grace. We could use some help, so we'd love to have you here at 8 a.m. Uh, downstairs, and we will give you uh, an opportunity to serve. I want to thank uh, Nancy and Sylvia for providing our music, and Donna Sue for directing the choir. Thank you so much. While Christopher is away, we appreciate not having to break out the kazoos. <laughs> we have coffee and treats in Fellowship Hall following our worship this morning, and you are all invited to come downstairs for a time of fellowship, so please consider joining us this morning. Everything you need to follow along with our worship is printed in your bulletins. We begin this morning with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. You are invited to either remain seated or to kneel. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only you know, forgive us, Lord. Amen. And now hear the good news. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gathering hymn for this morning is number 796. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. first reading for today is from the 17th chapter of Genesis, beginning with the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring, offspring after you. God said to Abraham, and for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsibly Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. You will fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The Lord shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May their hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow down before God. For the kingdom belongs to the Lord. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim in generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. <clears throat> The second reading for today is from the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning with the 13th verse. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. 
Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no, dis no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. They will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated and I invite the kids to come down for a children's message. I have a deck of cards in my hand. I see you all looking. I have a deck of cards. Come on down. Have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. Have a seat. Good morning. Have a seat. Over there. Perfect. So could we, um, on the count of three, wake up? Could we wake up the balcony on the count of three? Ready? One, two, three. Good morning! Good morning! Thank you very much. OK, so I have a deck of cards here in my hands, and I want to do a magic trick for you. OK? All right. So here we go. Pick a card. Don't let me say it. Pull it out of there. Show them. Did you pick one? Just one. Just one. I'm, I'm not that good, but one card. Okay. Put it back in the middle of the deck. Okay. Is it in? All right. So they picked a card. 
They showed everybody, right? Now, I am gonna snap my finger, and then your card that you picked is gonna be right on top of the deck. Ready? That wasn't loud. There we go. Turn the top card over. Is that your card? That's not your card? No, it's not your card. You can put it back. There were a lot of instructions on how to do this, and I didn't read them. So, um, really, there, I didn't really want to do a magic trick. What I wanted to do was snap my finger. The whole point is that a lot of times, this is how we deal with God. We have things happen in our life, and a lot of times we go, God, could you please make this better? God, could you make this somehow a different situation? God, I need your help. We snap our fingers, and we have this expectation that when we snap our fingers, that God's going to make everything better. That's not actually how God works, okay? When life is hard, we really do want God to intervene for us, and we pray to God, but we, we, we don't always, we get a little too, um, let's say, we have an idea of how we want God to act. So the gospel story that I just read, Peter has an idea of how he wants Jesus to act. And Jesus has just told Peter that things aren't going to go the way Peter thinks. And Peter desperately wants Jesus to snap his fingers and make everything different. Are you reading? Don't read. Don't read what I'm say. <laughs> but Jesus gets a little angry with Peter, and he tells Peter, that's actually not how things work. That is, we have to follow Jesus, we have to follow God's way. And sometimes that means doing things that we don't always want to do. Sometimes that means we have to be nice to people we don't always want to be nice to, because we're sharing God's love. Sometimes it means doing things that we didn't want to do because they're inconvenient for us. We had something else planned, but God says, hey, listen, I'd really like you to serve, but I'd really like to watch TV. Yeah, but I'd really like you to help. And sometimes we have to, take, we have to make those kinds of decisions. We have to follow the way that Jesus leads, and sometimes we think we can snap our fingers, but that's not how it works. So we just want to follow God and follow the way of Jesus. So I hope that you will look for ways to not snap your fingers at God, but look for ways to help people. Okay? Let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, help us be on the lookout today for ways we can serve you for ways we can serve you by helping other people by helping other people and people said amen and the devil said Bum. and jesus said Shoot. thanks for coming up you guys can go to sunday school you guys go back to your seats Thank you. are you going to stick around with me you're going to stay up here are you preaching today no okay One day he's going to preach. <laughs> and we're all going to remember this. I'm not kidding. One day Mateo's going to preach. And we're going to remember him sitting there. Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There was a woman who took up running, and she decided that one of her goals was to complete a road race. So she prepared. She lifted weights. She ran every day. She pushed herself a little further and further. And finally, when she thought she was ready, she signed up to run a half marathon, 13 miles, a race that she felt that she could complete. So she got to the race, she lined up, and they shoot off the starter pistol, and she's running. And an hour goes by, and she's feeling pretty good, and she's still running. She's doing pretty well. And then she hits the two-hour mark. And she's starting to feel like, maybe this race should be over soon. 
It's been two hours. She's wondering why she's not seeing the end of the race yet. And it doesn't seem like anybody else is thinking about finishing anytime soon. So as she's running, she asks one of the other runners and she finds out she's not in a half marathon. She's running a full marathon, which is 26.2 miles. And so she keeps running. She didn't just want to stop and admit defeat. She didn't want to admit that she'd made a mistake. But the whole time, she is saying to herself and to anyone else, this is not the race that I signed up for. This is not the race that I signed up for. Ultimately, she finished the race. But this was not the race that she signed up for. And I thought about that story because I think this morning that is kind of what Peter is saying to Jesus. Jesus tells him that he's going to undergo a great suffering, be rejected by the elders, and be killed. Peter, I'm sure, was not expecting this when he put down his net and followed Jesus. Rejected and killed by those in power this is not the race I signed up for, thinks Peter. This is not the race that I signed up for. And people have been, who have been hanging around Jesus and the church for a while, they know what Peter's going through. We can commiserate with poor Peter because usually we too didn't sign up for this race. At the first congregation that I served at, there was a very smart woman who was a member of the council, and she was a member during a rather tough and conflicted time in the congregation. And she was caught right in the middle of the conflict. At the same time, she was also a leader in a company that she worked for, and she knew how to navigate conflict. But there was something about conflict at church that really bothered her. And one day she was sitting in my office talking about what was happening, and she said, Pastor, I just want to stop all this stuff and get back to what church is really about, praying and meditating on God and Jesus and listening to good music. In other words, Pastor, this is not the race that I signed up for. Then I have a colleague of mine who had this member of her congregation who was very involved in the church. But he told this story about how there were these guys around his apartment who were upsetting him because they were stealing um, cash out of their neighbor's cars. And he knew that they had also painted graffiti on the garages around his house. And one day he came to church really annoyed. But he wasn't annoyed at these guys. And instead he was annoyed at Jesus and the church. And he said, before, I would have just cracked these guys over the head and taught them a lesson. But now, I have to think about what Jesus would do. This is not the race I signed up for. When I was younger, I was married, raising two daughters. My ex-husband was a Lutheran pastor. I was going to church. I became an assisting minister. I joined the social ministry committee. I started doing Bible studies, and suddenly the whole tra- trajectory of my life changed. I started to hear a call to become a pastor. And after some lengthy arguments with God, I eventually went to seminary. This is not the race I signed up for. When Jesus called Peter, Peter may have thought that he was signed up for some fame, some security, some adventure. Maybe he thought Jesus and the disciples would get the Roman Empire out of their business, or maybe they would just reform the synagogue and change how some things were done. We don't know exactly what Peter thought he signed up for. But it sure wasn't this race. Not the rejected by the authorities suffer and be killed race. Not that race. 
So when Jesus says that he's going to suffer and be killed, Peter says, no, this can't be. You can't do this. But Jesus tells Peter, and Jesus tells us, you don't run the show. You, get behind me. And this is a reminder for us as well. We follow Jesus. We don't decide the way it's supposed to be. We follow Jesus' way. And this is not always easy stuff. If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up my cross. The cross that Jesus talks about is not how some people refer to normal hardships and pain. My hip hurts, that's the cross I have to bear. I got a traffic ticket, that's my cross to bear. No. The cross that Jesus talks about is this cross. It's the cross we bear when we sacrifice ourselves and our own direction and follow Christ's direction. When our own wants take a back seat and our compassion for others takes a priority. When we see the face of Jesus in the stranger and the difficult people in our lives, when we think of the needs of the world over our own needs. The author Diana Butler Bass says, taking up a cross isn't just an inconvenient ordeal, a persistent sin, or annoying demand. Taking up the cross doesn't mean whining or seeking attention when confronted with trouble. When you take up Jesus' cross, you choose to surrender the burdens of self-pretension in favor of cumbering yourself with compassion and love of neighbor. This cross puts one in tension with injustice, the powerful, violence, bigotry, and delusions of grandeur. That's the cross Jesus instructs his followers to pick up. The yoke of this cross is ultimately not heavy, but light. When we follow Jesus, we deny ourselves, deny our plans, and follow Jesus' plans. When we're moved to do things that aren't in our best interest, that don't profit us, we find ourselves in situations that we wouldn't find ourselves in in a million years, then that is the cross that Jesus wants us to pick up. That is the race that Jesus wants us to sign up for. Those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, we'll save it. So is that the end of Jesus' story? Life is hard and then you die. Is that where Jesus leaves us? Of course not. Because we know what happens after the cross. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. Each time we experience these little deaths, those wilderness places in our lives, God brings us to a new and transformed life. A life that is changed, a life that is a little better than the old one we left. One that is authentic and real. One that is closer to God and God's compassion. Not the same as before, but changed. God doesn't just leave us down in the mess. God picks us up from there and restores us to new life. Maybe this is not the race that we signed up for, but this is the life that God has in store for us. This is the race that we are running, and this is the promise of God. We lose our life, but God promises to find it again. Today I pray we hear the good news that we are called to take up our cross because we follow the one who not only took up his cross but also revealed that nothing in this world 
not even the hate and darkness and death that seemed so present and unavoidable on that Friday that we dare to call good can defeat the love and light and life of God. Amen. Now I invite you to turn to hymn 759, and I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing. And now let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the Church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. We turn to you for renewal. Save lives and ecosystems threatened by pollution and a changing climate. 
Cleanse the earth's waters and restore the soil. Preserve rainforests, deserts, and wildlife that generations to come may cherish your creation. Hear us, O oh God. We turn to you for justice. Uphold the worth and dignity of every person, especially any who experience hatred and rejection because of gender, ability, sexual orientation, color, ethnicity, or religion. Hear us, O oh God. We turn to you for healing. Send compassionate helpers to any who suffer because of war and violence. Shelter unhoused people, befriend those who are lonely, bring hope to any in despair, and console the bereaved. We pray especially for Aaron Alfano, Jan Bertolet, Ingalor Bruno, Kim Cave, Sherry Daddario, Joan Esterly, Mason Fiervanti, Jackson, Bernice Kaufman, Larissa Kelly, Carl Kendall, Tony Lawrence, Joseph Marciello, Paul Moore, the family of John Patterson on his death, Penny Pinto, Myrtle Schlauch, Laurel, Lauren Sullivan, Marie Swigert, Cynthia Vincent, Ginny Whiteman, Jan Yost, Joan Youngerman, Kathy Zadlow, and Albert Ziegler. Hear us, O oh God. We turn to you for purpose. Remind us of your faithfulness to this congregation. Increase our trust in your guidance and keep us near the cross. Grant that our acts of service will express Christ's sacrificial love. Hear us, O oh God. We turn to you for peace. We honor the saints who lived in service to others. Inspire us by their example until you gather us into your kingdom. Hear us, O oh God. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. And now, dear church, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share that peace with one another.
Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the Lord's table, and God does the inviting, and everyone is welcome to the table. Bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come.
I invite you to rise in body or spirit. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Amen. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Our sending hymn for this morning is number 812. Go in peace, share your bread, 
Thanks be to God.